Now we're back again. Mel and me, Mel way over in Ireland, me right here in the United States, 3,000 miles apart, the two of us. And, and what's good is we, we have, we said, as we were ending the last segments, we said that we would look at the comments. Mel has looked at the comments. We're getting lots of good comments. And we said that we would answer, respond to your comments, which is what we're doing now. So this in some ways is a Q&A response. The questions that you've thrown up to Mel, uh, Mel has come back and he's going to take on a question concerning who these Taiyai are and uh, whether or not they are Asian or Chinese. When you, uh, Mel, good, well, uh, good to have you back again. When you say Asian, define what you mean by Asian. So we're talking about, say, the Far East rather than, okay. yeah. Uh, because we're getting a lot of people saying, what do you mean by Asian? Because if you're in UK, Asian means Pakistani, Indian, Bangladesh. But here yeah. in America, when you say Asian, that means all of Asia. And then, of course, but more likely, more likely. So we're talking about Chinese. We're talking about the Oriental, Orientalist, yeah, yeah. Not Orientalist, sorry, the Orient. Uh, even yeah. not the Orient. See, th this is so let's just call them Chinese for now. Let's just do that. Yeah. So yeah. what you're going to do and what's uh, what he's going to do, he's going to answer that question. And then he's going to end with a nip in the butt. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say what it is. I'm going to let him introduce that to you because you're going to see that he's going to end with a little bit of a surprise. And this is what we love about Mel. He always has surprises for us. Not only does he do, do good research, he also is able to bring it down so that we can understand it. And then also, in this case, bring you something as a goodbye present. So over to you, Mel. I let you then wax eloquently. Okay, so I suppose the, the question or the challenge that I've seen in the comments is I was arguing that really the early leaders were not Asian. It just seems that way because the artwork to do with Muhammad, etc., was depicted as, as Asian, Far Eastern. But I was arguing that that could be for a number of reasons. It could be that the, the people themselves were influenced by that style of art. And it also could represent the fact that by the 10th and 11th century, you have people like the Mongols, etc., you know, Central Asia and further east who are now in control. And they're just representing their own identity as, as uh, part of their interaction with Islam. And it's interesting that it's it, from Central Asia and further east. That's where the Hadiths are being written. Uh, we obviously don't know exactly when the, the first Hadiths were being written. It's, there was some evidence that it was later. But it's interesting, some of the comments from Muslims uh, to the videos were that, well, these artists were not Muslims, but these were writing in places where these were um, drawing artwork in places where they were also supposedly writing the Hadith. So are they Muslims or are they not Muslims? You can't have it both ways, you know. So I would say be careful. Oh, Mamel, where where are we talking about? Where are the how where I mean the Thai IA, we've said right here. Can you just define real quickly what is the place we're talking about locate located on a map and then tell yeah. me, tell us why that is why that confronts the S the, the standard Islamic narrative. Yeah, sure. So the Thai IA are located in places like Mesopotamia, which we call Iraq or northern Iraq today, and also Between parts of Syria. Between the two rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates, that's what Mesopotamia means. Yeah. Um, and whereas the Sen would say that the Arabs that started Islam were from way down in the Hejaz. It's about halfway down Arabia. So Central two Arabia. Two very distinct places. Yeah. So we'll just okay. put a map up here. Here's a map. Here you can see where Mesopotamia is, and there you can see where the Sin takes place. You can see they're hundreds of miles of, uh, away from each other. Okay, so I'm going to just share my PowerPoint here with you. Right, and now this picture that we'll see a little bit later, What's it's a picture of the Buddha, and if we think back to... The last video, we'll have noticed that there were images of the Buddha, sorry, <laughs> slip of the tongue there, Freudian slip maybe. There were images of Muhammad from, say, the 16th century onwards, which depict him radiating light. And it's interesting that this image here from the 9th century has a Buddha radiating light in exactly the same way. Um, and so it, I would suggest that uh, later Muslims borrowed ideas from the Buddhists here on that score. And the Buddha would be obviously Chinese, just so people know what we're talking about. Buddha would be from parts of what is today China. And yeah. Now, um, so in terms of my evidence for suggesting that, no, the, the leaders weren't Asian from the 7th to the 9th century, there's loads of evidence. We we saw these before, the Khazar al Hair al-Garbi, 8th century. This is a um, a, a palace uh, which was owned by the Umayyads, 
And as you can see here, the figure is clearly from the Middle East uh, with um, a Sasanian style headscarf, which obviously is Persian. So that's interesting. And on the right hand side, uh, again, from another Caliph's palace, Hisham's palace here, you can see clearly that he's not Asian. He's somewhere from Syria or perhaps Mesopotamia, but certainly not Asian. So that kind of, that's already some evidence that the leaders were not Asian. Now there's a bit more. We also saw that the seventh century's Tang China Royal Tomb mural paintings, which was from the late seventh century, depicted the ambassadors from the Fulin, which are the East Roman Empire, or what we would call the Byzantines. As you can see from the image there, clearly not Asian. Most surprising was that Muawiya had sent an Astorian monk, and that we commented about that the last day. But um, I, I was looking at that image of the Nestorian monk, and I was thinking, where have I seen this face before? And uh, it struck me, it looked very similar to the Star Trek character that I'm sure many of our audience might see the similarity, but that's only a little jokey aside here. Um, if we look at another image, we also saw the Taiye depicted like this, and uh, uh, one viewer pointed out that the cap he's wearing is a Phrygian cap, and uh, this is one that was worn by the Persians and also by the Byzantines. Um, and this person is, if we can judge from the clothing, was not from the Hejaz, but most likely from Mesopotamia, as we would expect, uh, based on everything we've found over the past year or two. Now, is there any more evidence um, for that crucial period from the 7th century to the 9th century? And I would say yes. So the rest of this presentation is really going to just show you what we've got. Uh, and there's probably hundreds of more examples. So here's an interesting one. This figurine was buried in the tomb of Emperor Taizong. And notice the, the time frame, 598 to 649 AD. So this would be in the early um, seventh century. And you can see that he's wearing a Phrygian cap. He's got a very uh, large nose and protruding forehead. He's certainly not Asian looking um, and uh, very interesting clothing. And uh, apart from that, that's, that's what we can draw from that. Here's another figurine that was found, again, wearing a Phrygian hat. And, you know, the camel was synonymous with the Arabs, so we can be pretty certain that it's an Arab that's been depicted, possibly a Persian, but we're talking about that neck of the woods. And again, judging from the nose, it's clear that it isn't a Far Eastern that's been depicted. Here's another one. Um, I, this, did you want to jump in on that, Jay? No, this one is an obvious one. This, one, yeah. uh, this is certainly not Chinese, and you can see very clearly that that would be either er quite Arab looking. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so possibly Arab or Persian, um, but certainly not um, Asian, Far but Eastern. The full beard. The full beard is symptomatic of that part of the world, not at all Chinese. Yeah, and it's good. It's you know, it's a good strong beard. It's not like a very light, uh, whisp whispery, um, or we call them Fu Manchus. Fu Manchus. These three strands that are very popular in in places like China and Mongolia. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Uh, he's clearly got a massive nose there, um, and a bit of a paunch on the belly. Um, interesting garments that he's wearing with lapels and. Uh, and so on. And the hat seems to be another version of the, the Phrygian cap. And then we have this one, a tomb of Wang Chen, who died in 679. He, he looks very much like Gandalf, <laughs> if, uh, if any of the audience are familiar with Lord of the Rings. And what's, what's interesting is he's wearing a, kind of like an animal skin. Uh, it could be a leopard skin. And uh, that would suggest, I would suggest... Uh, I would suggest uh, Mesopotamia, because at that time they had a lot of uh, wild cats in that area, right up to just a couple of centuries ago. Um, so that would suggest that area again. And of course, the camel would reinforce that idea that that's who we're talking about. Um, and uh, full beard, as you can see, full mustache um, and protruding nose that would indicate that he's not from the Far East. Here's another one, uh, or another two, in fact, um, from 
This is from the tombs at uh, Luo Yang. And uh, again, the Phrygian cap is a common feature. And what's interesting with all of these uh, figurines, these are from different parts of China. And so we can be confident that this is a consistent um, impression that the Arabs gave when they came to China. Here's another one. Again, we notice large nose, big ears, and so on. And uh, we get a sense of the clothing that they wore there as well. Here's another one. Um, here's uh, this time a couple of images. Again, we can see the fridging cap on display, the camels and so on. So this gives us a really interesting sense of what they looked like, these people who had, had gone to China. Okay. Now, the, for this next image, I got a note from my Chinese contact. This is 9th century, and he says that this is the first image of people from West Asia, um, in particular, down the, the left corner of the painting that can be found dressed like Arabs from the Hejaz. Now, I have no um, evidence one way or the other to support that view. I'm sure if uh, he'll, he'll send me more evidence for his contention. So the person down the left hand corner of this next image, he reckons is from the Hejaz, as opposed to the earlier images that we saw, which were further north. Now, this is interesting because this fits in nicely with when we when we think of um, Mecca beginning, sort of the middle of um, the 8th century onwards, that's when the Hejaz is starting to, to gain in importance. And so by the 9th century, we'd expect that um, there'd be more people from the Hejaz that would be going further east. This, is, this would be the Abbas, Abbasid narrative. So this would make yeah. sense because now the Abbasid narrative is very clear that uh, that Mecca would be in place and Muhammad would be now in place and Muhammad would be down from the central part of Arabia by the ninth century. Yeah. So according to my contact, this person here was from the Hejaz. Now, as I say, I, I can't neither confirm or deny this, um, but that's what he, what he reckons. I'll have to wait to see what his evidence is in support of that. You can see the two characters here um, just above. Um, I don't know if you can... Yeah. See my cursor? Probably not. There we are. These two figures here. I would suggest they are probably um, from India, Pakistan, that, that area. Probably northern India, somewhere up there. Um, and our, our Indian viewers would probably be able to identify the features uh, more strongly and be able to say, well, actually, it's, that person looks just like my granddad down the road or whatever, you know. Um, so that might be helpful if, if our Indian viewers are watching. They might be able to say um, more clearly where they think that those are from. Now, what's, uh, if we look to the one on the right, we can see that he's wearing very strongly a Persian hat. But notice what's happening. They are offering gifts to a Buddha, which I think there's something about that in Islam. Is that, <laughs> that's not really what they're meant to be doing at that time. In the ninth Absolutely century, not. I mean, this would this would also this would be heretical, and unless, of course, this the fact that they're offering to another god is it's not so much that they're offering to a political ca character, but this in this case they're offering to a deity, therefore supporting mm -hmm. that deity would be uh, anathema. Yeah, and like if if anyone is in doubt, just look at that figure down there. Uh, let's let's go. go uh, the, um, let me just show you the next one here. You can see that right down at the foot of the Buddha is a camel, which obviously is very indicative of an Arab. It's kind of symbolically representing the presence of Arabs in that group. Um, and there's that image of the Persian there. And uh, I think one thing I read is that it's probably bags of gold dust that's been offered to the deity. Um, I think, and so I, I consider this very damaging stuff. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that these people themselves who are visiting are Buddhists, just simply that they are willing to do whatever they need to do to um, set up good relationships, because for them, the trade that they're doing with the Chinese is the most important thing. And they'll, they'll make their offerings to the Buddha, whether they believe in the Buddha or not. But for me, I think that's idol worship, regardless of what uh, you think interiorly. Um, I think that's Just to be uh, fair, and a comeback that the Muslims may say is yes, but this is a Chinese painting, therefore it's the Chinese who are depicting these emissaries uh, with devotion 
to Buddha. I do notice that the one that's just below on the right, he's looking away from Buddha as he is offering homage. So that could be indicative of the fact that there was some problems and he yeah, has black sure. faced, uh, which could yeah. be also the Chinese way of saying that this is a shameful on them. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, and, and also that, you know, we can actually look at uh, maybe perhaps in another time that we, we have records of some Arabs who went to the Chinese court who refused to bow or kneel to the emperor. And, uh, and that could um, be and that, that, cause, that could be the yes. one you see at, at, yeah. uh, towards the bottom. But it's, it's not as black and white as perhaps the standard Islamic narrative would have us believe. Not all of the, um, the early Arabs who went to China were, let's say, strongly Muslim. They were willing to, to be tolerant of other religions um, at that time. But as we see later in history, um, that tolerance disappeared um, and uh, th there was a much stronger um, antipathy towards other religions. Let's put it that way. So that's it for me. It's nice and short and sweet today. Um, well, tell us what you think. <laughs> yeah, listen, I, I, I mean, this is this is this is what I, this is good. This is quick and to the point. And what you're saying really is, um, it, again, you're going to the paintings, and I love you because you're bringing another a whole another genre for us. We've looked at the we've looked at all the kiblas and the mosques. Dan did that. We've looked at the uh, all of the inscriptions on the rock inscriptions. Uh, we've looked at the coins and uh, Odin we'll be coming up with a whole new category of, uh, we've just done it, we've just recorded it, it's going to be coming up after you do your series here, looking at the coins again. And this is, you're going to be fascinated by what he has found on the coins. And now we're looking at the paintings. So it doesn't matter what type of genre we use, they all are saying the same thing. Here you have pictures by Chinese. So there's no, in this case, the Chinese are away from the Abbasids. Abbasids have no control over these paintings. So therefore they cannot sublimate them. They cannot destroy them like they did with a lot of the Umayyad uh, paintings. Uh, and they cannot get, they cannot get rid of them in any way. So we can see a genre that is completely devoid of any censorship. And what we're noticing is that on this, on these paintings, you have these pictures of the emissaries who are coming from the Tayai. And the Tayai is way up in the north, up in Iraq, not down in the Hejaz. Have, uh, just, just, just curiously, have you found any pictures anywhere from the Hejaz in the 7th and 8th century? None. 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 So all None. of the pictures, and so the only people who had contact with the Chinese were from Mesopotamia, between the two rivers. What is the Iraq today? And possibly over in Syria, further over to the West. So that's where they're, all these pictures are from. And they're showing them. And you can see that they're, they're from that area because look at the... And what's fascinating is you see the same themes all the way throughout the pictures. Uh, they have the Phrygian cap, which is Phrygian cap, sorry, which is the cap that was used in that part of the world at that time. They all have camels, uh, which means that's the, because for getting across and going places, they always use camels. That's what the traders used. They all had large noses. They had beards. <laughs> they had paunches. And many of them were wearing leather clothes, leather frocks and leather. Uh, in some cases, uh, they were also wearing like the monk, the monk frock and with the, with the balding, uh, the, the haircut that monks use. So you can see that these are clear images, not from the South, not from the South, not from Arabia that we know today, not from the Hejaz, but from much, much further north. In this case, the Northeast. So we're talking about Kufa and we're talking about Stesiphon and, and uh, the Persian areas and also then the, the, uh, the over to the west up in Syria. Well, and it's not till the ninth century that we start seeing these Arab characteristics come. So even if you follow the sequence in the paintings, the paintings will show you exactly what was happening. And all of this story and all the narrative is taking much up place much further north because of what the clothes they wear. Ninth century, then we start getting into the, we're in the Abbasid period. So now those emissaries that are coming from the Abbasid courts would be Arab because the Abbasid courts uh, would have moved. They're still, uh, interestingly, they're still in Baghdad. That's what's interesting. But they now include Mecca because Mecca would be the sanctuary. And now you have an awful lot more. Uh, you have an awful lot more give and take coming back and forth between Mecca and Baghdad in the ninth century. And so that shows up in the paintings again. So as you said in the last in your last episode, paintings or pictures don't lie. So follow the paintings, follow the pictures, and follow the story by following the paintings. 
like we've done with all these different genres, it comes out to the same thing. Bless you. Thank you so much. This is good. I love it because this is another genre that we can offer to the rest of the world, which confronts the standard Islamic narrative. It all of this confronts sin because God bless you. Thanks so much. Can't wait for the next one. This is Jay here in the United States and Mel smiling as ever there in Ireland over and out.